This is chapter 11 in the Marriage and Family course, looking at work and economics. We've touched on some of these things before, but we'll get into more detail with them this lecture. A lot of traditional norms with respect to marriage, work, and family, but we see that employment still tends to take precedent over family and that because we have to make a living and the family work that we've talked about, particularly with gender roles, done mostly by women. There's about 120 million workers in the U.S. that work an average of about 42 and a half hours per week. 60% of the married couples now are dual earners. Employed mothers still spend much more time on childcare activities than employed fathers, so that's part of that second shift that we've talked about. The work hours in the United States have been increasing you know, because of the emphasis that we put on work, and it's the only advanced economy that does not guarantee a paid vacation. That's kind of on a company-by-company uh, company basis. The balance of work and family where having to divide that time as to making a living and then raising your family. Over half of parents surveyed feel there's not enough time spent on the family, that employment typically does not allow for this flexibility or this control and scheduling, and the respondents do tend to report an increasing difficulty in making that balance. Now, what we call work spillover that's the effect of work absorbing more time and energy that could be used with the family, and that could have other adverse effects, as in particularly affecting the mood, increasing fatigue, the exhaustion that's brought home from the work. Women do tend to be more affected on this because they are the ones that are generally coming back from work, a full day at work, and then having to deal with much of the the family work as well, and then going the other direction, family to work, spillover. The responsibilities from home or personal issues at home could uh, adversely affect your job as well. So this is what we talk about when we get into the concept of role conflict. The demands of one role make successful formats of the other role more difficult such as the role of being a vice president at a bank affects the role of being a mother, vice versa. The concept of role strain means that there's more demands placed on the status of the caregiver or the provider, for example. Work stress might actually reduce the parental availability, such as the, job, the dad being gone most of the time. In part of the traditional norms that we touched on, men are expected to give more of the priority to the jobs because that's they're the ones that are providing the resources for the family. This concept of crossover, where you have work-related stress, which is potentially negative, versus engagement, which is potentially positive, affects the partner in similar ways. So if you are bringing home stress from work, it could also have an effect on your partner bringing them some stress. The traditional division of labor, as we've hit on before, is that the male husband, sole wage earner, 31% of married couples with children have that model. Industrialization, as we talked about, shifted uh, farming to wage earning families and that and created the, the concept of the housewife, among other things that we talked about. Men traditionally in charge of the, the maintenance of the household, things such as lawn mowing, you know, perhaps more physically active activities in the outdoors, helping with the children rather than the nurturing and the raising role of children. As of 2013, 
percent of women out earn their husband, and that number has certainly increased somewhat since then, as we are seeing more of the what you call the women being the predominant breadwinners or the higher earners. Cultural expectations of women as the homemaker still exist. The status of non-work being uh, in charge of the family, and that has also been associated with economic dependence. Being dependent on your partner would then continue to uh, put women in these particular roles as the, as the domestic role. Increasingly, more women in the labor force, 57%. Of women greater than 16 are now in the labor force, as close to 69% of men. That's actually gone down a little bit for men. So that's a huge change for women, up from 32% since 1960. 75% of married women with children are now employed. Wives exceed husbands' in income in 29% of the dual earner households. As I said, that's going up. And some Negative associations with this, particularly after we've been um, traditionally enculturated to where men are the dual earners in a patriarchal society, well, then this could have a, an effect on men's sense of self-esteem. 60% of married couples with children are both employed. So why the increase in women's employment? And this is a, another repeat of something that we've talked about before, particularly as we go back to the 60s, as the golden age of capitalism is providing more demand for workers, the more women are entering the workforce. There's an increase in single mothers around, uh, as we get from that area, there's a increase in women's educational attainment as well. There's more equal opportunity the women's movements are pushing this as well. Decline in the men's real wages, particularly since the 1970s. Real wages have somewhat flattened out, so there's more of an economic need for the dual earning couples, and there's more there's increase in social support, recognition, self-esteem of having the women out there in the workforce being decision makers, breadwinners. So the women's employment is increasingly being perceived in a positive light, a trend for the better in order to maximize your brain power to get uh, a more efficient workforce. 50% polled, however, feel this makes it harder for a successful marriage. So there again, there's, there's that trade-off where we see that in order to get the jobs and be successful out there, in the workforce, takes away from the family, comes harder to raise children, about the same number, feel that the child would be better off at the mom, mom at home. In order to have a one parent there home full time. So we'll get into some of those trade-offs later on. Younger women are placing more value on career success as part of the trend Traditional norms place more value on the man making a good come being a good spouse. So with the uh, change in the economy, the more return of women into the workforce, things like that, are changing these traditional norms. More than half of the first-time mothers return to the job in six months, some even sooner than that. So that shows you how even having a, a child then back to the workforce, how those norms have changed over the past few decades. Women, however, are more likely to cut back or work part-time due to the family demands, so that's still somewhat of an expectation. Looking at dual earners, 60% of married couples with kids under 18 are dual earning couples. The median income of the male sole breadwinner is around 70,000 and it's about 115,900 for dual earners wives as sole breadwinner not very far away actually from men as sole breadwinners you can see right there 
even though there is disparities overall in general. 33, or excuse me, 83% of women and 65% of men report some housework on an average day, so you can see that's certainly weighted more heavily towards women. Men, however, do spend more time at the workplace in general and are more likely to see. So here's an interesting counterintuitive thing here is that even though the men that spend more time at the workplace are more likely to see household load as shared. So that may have to do with, uh, you know, increased education and income that correlates with, with a lot of these other things. As far as sharing the load, cohabitating and same-sex couples do tend to display more of the task sharing. Men appear to share more when the female's partner's work hours increase. So, you know, that's fairly logical that if the female partner is at work more often, the man's going to have to take up the load at the home. But that also means there's less time for women in addition to the increased status for women in the workforce. Due to the socialization, socialization that men are uh, put through typically in a society like ours, that uh, if you do not provide for your family, then that's kind of a hit on your masculinity or, or if the woman is out earning the man. Those are some things that we've touched on. And the older you get, the less you would uh, do on that respect. Employed women do report more positives as far as sharing the load. Women, again, do more of the emotion work as far as putting the emphasis on feelings in the relationship and as far as uh, sharing the load goes. When it comes to sharing child care, Men increasingly agree they should do more, but the accessibility still lags because men, how they're socialized to be more providers than timesharers, and of course spending a little bit more time at work. Fathers typically are more involved with their sons, and particularly more with the younger the children are. Fathers with more prestigious time-demanding jobs are obviously less engaged in child rearing. Might be a trade-off there of providing more income and resources for the family. Fathers are a little bit more involved on the interactive activities rather than the normal raising and nurturing type roles, whereas the mothers are looking more at the custodial child care needs, particularly the infant needs. As far as power sharing in this regard, employed wives exert more power at home, but there's still cultural norms that are somewhat difficult in changing. They put greater responsibility of housework on the woman, as we've already said. The demands for equal sharing may result in conflict or, you know, strings attached. You do this, if, if I do this, then you'll do this. And then I'm sure that men are not, uh, I mean, they're willing to, to spread this rumor that they're not competent in housework, which is a uh, nonsense, of course. But uh, if that belief prevails, well, then that would prevent them from sharing more of the, the load there and, and keeping more of the power in their favor. So marital satisfaction does increase when men do share the load. However, conventional divisions of sharing this type of chore versus that type of chore still might be preferred. Employed women more likely to divorce, which is somewhat intuitive because they have other demands that could be taking away from their, their family or their spouse. But having the job and being able to be independent and economically secure, those that does seem to have more of a net positive. And this concept of status enhancement means where women are still at times choosing to stay uh, at home or to focus on helping their husband's career and that builds satisfaction for the husband as well as them because then they can become kind of a partner in their husband's career. So politicians and uh, high-powered executives may not necessarily need their wives to work so then they in, kind of incorporate them as part of this status enhancement concept. 
When it comes to shift work, we're looking at where parents are working opposite shifts, such as one working the day shift, 8, eight to 5, another one working the night shift, 4 to 12, whatever. Um, could be non-overlapping shifts, and there are some uh, pros and cons to this. 20% of all employed Americans are working some sort of form of shift work, one-third of dual learner couples. couples. So there is an increase in the service sector, but we, the service sector can, can continue to work 24 hours a day, so you would have more opportunities for non-overlapping shift work, technological changes in around-the-clock offices, or increasing the, the possibility of more shift work, and therefore you could perhaps use better child care arrangements to make that work for you. There are higher levels of negative work family spillovers with shift work because someone's working during a period that may not be natural to working, such as the graveyard shift is what they call it, from uh, midnight to eight. But there are there is the uh, increase in father-child closeness because the ch father is at home with the children while the mother is working her shift. So that as you can see, some some pros and cons there. And another big one that we'll talk about here in a minute is the costs of, of child care and the shift work would allow the parents to uh, alternate on taking care of the child rather than paying for additional child care. Okay, looking at stay-at-home fathers here, we still see that fairly small number, about 6.2% of married couples with children under 15 are at, with the stay-at-home fathers. And the reasons vary, but mostly due to unemployment, disability, retirement. So older uh, fathers might have a tendency to be more stay-at-home fathers. The trade-off of uh, less money versus less expense on child care, which can get fairly expensive. Men do lose a primary source of social interaction, which is the workplace by being stay-at-home fathers. There's an increased interaction between uh, fathers and children that requires a reshuffle of priorities. So again, we see some positive benefits, trade-offs here. There is a four-fold increase of men saying reason is to care for the family. So that may have reasons for you know, economic reasons to, uh, if the wife has got a good job, then the father would step up the responsibility, take care of the family. Women have still earn about 82% of men in general. And then in the long term, they are likely to learn earn less over the long haul. And the more that women tend to dominate a profession, the less it pays. So that's still some, some uh, evidence of male-dominated society and a little bit uh, difficulty of women reaching equality as far as income goes. 84% of sexual harassment charges are brought by women. The Me Too movement has also brought new highlights to that as far as men in positions of authority and power abusing that. Only 41% of women say said that they had reported it to their employers. So it's uh, uh, seriously underreported there. Looking a little bit more detail on uh, child care, school is actually the primary solution for working mothers. If they can send their kids to school, that, that um, provides a couple of benefits there as, as far as keeping the, the uh, child covered while the parent is at work, plus, you know, as far as getting schooling and, and then, of course, saving the, the cost of day court care because those can be get ex very expensive. Ch daycare costs range anywhere from 4000 18000 per child annually, so there's a wide range there. And the, the excessive non-maternal care at six to eight months old may have negative effects, so we show that we are somewhat inherently or biologically inclined to have that, uh, that very early care at that age. And high quality care, you know, of course, kind of as a function of what you might have to pay for there, but high quality care may also facilitate positive social development over the long term. Children are more likely to abused, be abused by a relative than they are a daycare worker. So that is a perception you know, back uh, a couple of decades ago, there was a couple of 
very horrendous scandals where daycare centers got accused of doing this and after destroying reputations and going through a lot of investigation it was d discovered that they weren't that it didn't happen so a little bit of paranoia can, resulted in that but again because of the dynamics of family and the prevalence of children being around family it's they're more likely to be abused by a relative than a daycare worker 33 percent of children 12 to 14 are left home alone in what is called self-care and so that kind of varies from family with family and um, you know you may have some of your own experience of how old you were when you were left home alone for the first time Big variation between countries, particularly more social democracy type countries such as France, almost all three to five year olds are enrolled in public funded preschools. There is a lack of affordable child care, particularly in the United States. It prevents mothers from taking jobs by having to stay home and take care of the kids and it could keep them in part-time jobs and continues to be a barrier to equal opportunity if they are continually uh, having to stay at home in order to avoid that child cost expense. The workplace generally has failed to recognize that family has radically altered over the years with more working moms in uh, different uh, diverse families there. Although some companies are adapting a little bit, there's really not much flexibility for work schedules, for day daycare, for time off in order to be with children. That is probably evolving right now as we speak, but generally companies not really geared for that. There are some benefits that the workplace does uh, provide, and the, there's evidence that employees either may not know about that or just don't utilize it. There is the perception that if you work less hours, you might not get promoted or you might fear being laid off whether it's not you don't know about the policies, you could have an incentive boss. Well, that never happens, of course. No, obviously, boss may be fairly demanding that where you can't take advantage of some of these benefits. And then, of course, there are cases where people may actually be prefer to be at work rather than be at home dealing with uh, the wife and kids. So that, again, that varies from, uh, from person to person, family to family. And these findings, as we've discovered throughout the class, when you're dealing with human behavior and personal disclosure of information, these findings are sometimes difficult to generalize. Are people satisfied with work but not with being at home? How do you know? How can you measure that? The employer support does, however, result in less of that work-family conflict. So if the the employer is providing some of these benefits or some of this flexibility that does have positive uh, results with, uh, with conflict. Looking at unemployment, official figures do not include those that are looking for the job. Therefore, they're not in the labor force. That's why unemployment figures don't tell you the whole picture. You might actually want to look at labor participation rates as well. There is emotional cost to being unemployed in addition to the financial costs. And considering that most people still get their health insurance from an employer-based insurance uh, benefit, that then not working also takes away that health benefit as well, which is a big, huge expense. And not surprisingly, single-parent women are the hardest hit with unemployment. Nothing else to rely on as far as the men's side. They, uh, you know, since it is a main source of self-esteem and pride, a lot of men are kind of defined by the work that they do. That could also have some emotional effects for men. So how do we go about reducing the work-family conflict? Well, external cultural support that we've touched on by employers and government, which is somewhat lacking in the United States, could help reduce that. The possibility of more flex time opportunities to be able to work when you're available to work. There are some ideas out there of job sharing where two employees uh, share a full-time job, which is essentially a part-time job, but it is perhaps an option. The idea of the compressed work week, we've looked at the, the four-day work week. Telecommuting, as we see now, will be more 
of a factor in the future once we get out of the current crisis. There are opportunities in some companies where you can bring your children to work and they will have on-site child care, even uh, the possibility of more family leave policies, paid time off, and of course more pay equity between uh, the working moms and the traditional fathers. So those are some ideas out there that would be coming down the pike for reducing some of this conflict that we've talked about. So that is Chapter 11, looking at marriage, work, and family. Stay tuned for Discussion Forum.